Great. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to another edition of Northshire Live. I'm Rachel Person. I'm the event manager for Northshire Bookstore in Saratoga Springs, New York. Um, and representing also my colleague, David Wood, who is not with us tonight, but is uh, handles events at our Manchester Center, Vermont location. Uh, a couple of quick notes before we get started with this evening's event and I introduce our authors. Um, first of all, you probably noticed as you came in that we are recording this event for a future broadcast on our YouTube channel. However, fear not, um, you can have your camera on. We have the settings arranged so that it is only recording those of us who are unmuted and speaking and in this lovely yellow box that I'm in. Um, so you will not be recorded, you will not be on YouTube for posterity, and you can have your camera on if you want. Um, in light of that, if you have any questions for our authors throughout the evening, please use the chat box to type them in. You can type them in at any point, and I will save them up and ask them for you when we get to the audience question and answer at the end of the evening. Um, and then last of all, before I introduce our authors, a huge thank you to all of you for your continued support of Northshire through this past almost year and a half now. Um, it's been tough times for small businesses um, and the incredible loyalty and generosity of our customers has made all the difference. In the world. We truly couldn't do it without you and we couldn't present great events without your help. So thank you so much for that ongoing support. Now, it is my very great pleasure to get to welcome Sarah Arnell to Northshire Live to celebrate the publication of her memoir, There Will Be Love. She's had an impressive career in fashion, writing and advertising, serving as the CEO of a New York advertising agency. He's now a professor at the New School's Parsons School of Design and the founder of Karmic, a platform for what you do comes back to you, ideas and advice. Um, and notably for those of us here in Saratoga Springs, she is an alum of Sycamore College. Yes, She's going to be interviewed tonight by Hugh Gallagher, who has written for publications including Rolling Stone, Wired, Harper's and Newsweek, and is the author of the novels Teeth and Chicken 65. Please join me in welcoming them both to Northshire Live. Thank you so much, Rachel. I'm really, really thrilled to be here and I appreciate you hosting this for us. Thank you so much. So should I just start? So as the book just came out Tuesday, I'm really going to assume that none of you have read it or perhaps haven't finished it. So I'm going to give you just, a, I guess, a little summary of what the book is about. And then I'm going to read a, a short selection before we start, a, uh, Hugh and I start a, a conversation um, and then the Q&A following. So this memoir covers a really difficult sort of four or so years of my life that you know, I call a midlife crisis. It was a time when I had felt like I'd made a real mess of my life. I didn't have a job anymore. My last child left for college. My body wasn't what I wanted to be. I was having hot flashes galore. Things were out of control. And I was really obsessed with, you know, being young and seeming young. In fact, so much so that the opening chapter of the book, which I hope you will read, um, really tells the story of a crazy night of partying one New Year's Eve with my son and his friends. And that's where the title of the book, There Will Be Lobster, comes from because when I woke up uh, one morning, that morning, what New Year's Day, after that New Year's, crazy New Year's Eve, I saw lobster crawl out from under my kitchen table. And it was this lobster that became this symbol of survival for me. And when I saw this lobster, I thought, well, if this lobster could survive whatever happened, um, I can too. And so that's sort of where the title comes from. And that's why the lobster is so symbolic for me. So there's a summary um, as best as I can do right now. So what I wanna do is read a really short selection that's about an encounter that I had in Saratoga with two women in Saratoga while I was in Saratoga working on the book. Um, and as you'll hear, it really stuck with me long after I left the town. Um, much as the magic of Saratoga sticks with people who, you know, come and visit and then leave. So I'm going to read, um, uh, I'm going to read an excerpt from this chapter. It's not that long. <laughs> I had settled into my room and was walking on the street to get some air and a bite to eat when I saw two young women coming toward me on the sidewalk. As we approached each other, one woman said she liked my coat. 
We exchanged smiles. Thanks, I said. Do you have time for a quick question? One of them asked me. Sure. Great. Okay. So what makes you happy in life? Nothing, I said. The two women exchanged glances, then stared back at me in silence. Service to others, one of the women said, will give your life meaning. I doubt it, I said, frankly. Would you like to talk about it, they asked. No, I said, I'm going through a hard time and I need to be alone. I need to work things out for myself. I've always been self-sufficient and I need to get back to that. I cry every day. It's not healthy. They aren't tears of joy. My youngest child moved out for college, leaving me all alone. My business folded and I'm out of a job. I have to face myself by myself for the first time in years. I have no friends because I blew them off in the name of work and kids. I have no one to talk to or turn to. I'm here in this town to seek solace. I'm on my way to get some food, then go back to my hotel room to scream in a pillow. Jesus will save you, one of the women said. The other handed me a postcard and told me they were sister missionaries from the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I told them to have a good day and we continued on our ways. I called my daughter to tell her I scared away two missionaries. That's quite a feat, she said hesitantly. What did you say to them? Well, I just told them you left home to go live your life and I was a little sad. That doesn't sound very scary, she said. Well, I may have also said a few other things, but what I really want to tell you is that I think I'm going to church on Sunday when I get home. I think they may have a point. Maybe Jesus will save me. Someone has to, for fuck's sake. I came back home from my trip upstate feeling freshly inspired and uncharacteristically unburdened. I responded to Z, who had by chance texted me to see if I wanted to meet for a drink, and I said yes, in all caps. Z was at the bar sipping a glass of red wine when I arrived. He ordered me one. No thanks, I said, and asked for a tequila on the rocks. He called me hardcore and said he liked it. I thought I saw him lick his lips. We sat down at a table and ordered. We made small talk. He had never been to this restaurant before. He was definitely coming back. Did I want wine with dinner or was I going to stick with tequila? He was having a party next week that I should come to. He's usually vegetarian, but mm, the salmon looked too good to pass up. His kids were amazing and exec's wife was a cunt. She was crazy. He was in love with her once, but not anymore. He dated a lot and hey, why not? He was a single man. Finally, he asked me what I'd been up to lately. I went to church for the first time in a long time, I told him. Why? He was shocked. He scowled at me. I started to tell him the story of the sister missionaries and how that encounter made me think that I needed prayer and God and this kind of hope and belief in my life again. He cut me off. You don't really believe in God, do you? I mean, you don't believe there's a guy up there in the sky looking down, right? I'm not sure what you mean, I said. I could have told him how I had stopped the sister missionaries in their tracks, how they had never encountered someone like me before. I could have joked that I was surprised they didn't call 911 and have me committed to the psych ward, but I didn't. I wanted to end this dinner. He told me that he was surprised that someone like me would believe in God. Someone like me, I repeated. Yeah, he said, someone smart. I asked him if his son were in a car accident and it was life and death, would he pray? Not to God, he said. Who would you pray to then? Not God, anyone but God. I don't know, the earth, the sky, but more importantly, I would get the best doctors money could buy and pray to myself to figure this out. I would save my son. I wouldn't leave it up to a God that doesn't exist. I told him that I would pray and pray and pray to God. I told him that if one of my children were on the verge of death, that I couldn't not pray, that I would not be able to avoid prayer. And in fact, it would probably take over my existence as I sat next to the hospital bed, holding hands and wishing for a voice to emerge from the silence and say, hi, mom. Thank you. <laughs>
Okay. So Hugh, let's chat. Yes. It's a real pleasure to be here. Thank you so much, Sarah. And thank you, Rachel, for hosting this event. The Maybe I should start by saying how surprised I was from your book and what I read. So for everyone listening, the first time I met Sarah, this is going to be in the late 90s at the Arnell Group, which was the hippest place to be in New York in terms of the industry. It was on Prince Street, beautifully designed studios. They were the first company. Your company was the first one I saw that was integrating things like uh, interior design, spatial branding, the branding of space, matching that with digital, doing signage, putting all that together for a brand experience was all very new, very hot, beautiful offices, you know, architecturally pristine. And uh, you were just my, you were my first boss, really, which was a stroke of luck to have you as my first boss. I learned so much in that job. So when you said to me, hey, Hugh, I wrote this book, I was expecting, you know, How to Crush in Branding by Sarah Arnell, because you have crushed. You've reached levels that I haven't reached, that other people aren't going to reach in their career that are very high levels, that are tough as nails. It's a really, really tough industry, and it, it requires so much talent and so much mental agility and sharpness to do what you've done. So I was expecting that book. I was expecting you looking cool, you know, with your arms crossed, like this is how to do it, kids. Mm -hmm. So when I read There Will Be Lobster and found a really uh, cathartic personal journey, I was really, really, it was a real swerve for me. It was like, I was like, whoa, I'm rarely surprised. It seems like we all kind of, almost it's like we, we are in our lives, especially professional lives, playing a role, playing a part, and we kind of know what the next move is as dictated by that part. I feel with this book, you really threw away a script and really threw away uh, expectations and went in an incredibly bold and brave direction. My question for that, and that's the, my surprise, is was that a choice or was that just, did it emerge? It was definitely a choice. Um, and, and, I, and I really love this question because you know what, you're right, I probably should have written the business book. And anytime I mentioned to anyone, you know, hey, I'm writing a book, they would be like, oh, amazing. I can't wait to read your business book. And it wasn't a business book, you know, at all. It turned out to be this, this memoir. But, you know, I never really, I guess, really want to do what people necessarily expect of me. And I really want to. And I also want to just say, like, and why isn't writing a memoir about my struggle as a woman in business trying to lead a company and trying to, you know, organize your family and be a mom. Why isn't that a business book? You know, it doesn't just have to be, you know, you know, you know, branding 101, you know, how to attract clients. Like, I think there's enough of that stuff in the world. And, you know, I really had um, a big career that I lost. And I think there's lessons in business too, as well as, you know, to be learned from, from, people who can relate to my story. I know I'm not the only one that that happened to. Mm -hmm. So um, what I really wanted to get out was to take responsibility for the journey that I went on. And I mm -hmm. wanted to write about that in order to give meaning to the pain that I went through and the pain I put other people through and the learning and the growth that came from it. And for me, storytelling some of the the things that had happened to me and some of the things that i did was my business book in a way you know it was really the business in my life that i just wanted to to put out there in full open uh honesty so um but, but yeah it was a decision not to write sort of the traditional typical business book because I think there's enough of that out there <laughs> right uh, from what you're saying, there's no denying that your business influence, your business background really influenced this in some way. So in branding, the business that we share, it's all about using words to manage perception and using words to project something. And I think in this book, what's so striking is how much you, you don't really manage. You don't really, uh, you're not, it's not a, you're not selling anything in this book. You're not trying to do that. And I'm wondering, shifting that gear from brand writing as we know it to being an author, what was that like? And how did each how did each discipline influence the other? 
Well, so years and years of marketing and advertising really taught me that, um, you know, when you're writing advertising copy, when you're writing a brand strategy, you're really working off of a brief that a client gives you. And you're really trying to form thoughts and words around what they want you to say to people about their brand. And it's never, it's never everything. It's always sort of a, a focus on an attribute or a focus on a benefit that they would have, right? And I spent years, I think, doing that for myself. I was like, Brand Sarah, you know, out there, you know, put on the happy face, you know, put on my little advertising persona, letting you see only what I wanted you to see about me. That's what I was trained to do. That's what I did for years. Mm. But then when I wrote this book, um, I decided my new brand wasn't that person anymore. My new brand was about sharing and transparency and openness and honesty. And so that is how I kind of took what I know from branding and just said, I'm going to rebrand as an authentic human being. <laughs> Did you do a strategy? Did you do a deck, your rebrand? I made a PowerPoint. No, really, I didn't. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it must have been liberating to finally write something without a PowerPoint, uh, without a deck. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Uh, one, one thing that I, I, I heard what you just said, what we had discussed earlier was the idea of toxic positivity. And that was something that this book is reacting or responding to. So what is your take on toxic positivity in our culture and business culture and why um, you wrote this book and, and how it kind of freed you from that? So in general, I think it's always better to be positive than negative for sure. But, you know, was things that I've started thinking about in, you know, talking to people. And I had a friend say to me the other day, and I had said to her, just, you know, regular conversation, hey, you know, how are you? How's it going? How are you feeling? She said, oh, I'm really, you know, I'm not really, really good at all. I had a terrible day. It was actually a really bad week. And, but I'm putting on a happy face and smiling and just being positive about it all, which is fine and, until it becomes to the point where you're not facing the issues that you're having. So, mm. it, so for me, toxic positivity is just trying to almost, and I hear this so much from people, I'm just going to be happy and manifest happy and I'm going to smile and then good stuff is going to come to me. So, you know, maybe it will, but in the end, we all really, in the end, have to do the work to get what we want in order to feel the way that we want to feel and, and be the person that we, we want to be. I think you get toxic positivity in the branding world too, where you have brands just telling you all the good stuff they only want you to hear and maybe none of the sort of less than, you know, exciting stuff or the less than appealing stuff. Sure. And that's our job is managing, managing those brands to make sure that all those brands lead like that. So I'm wondering, um, one, one of the things is- I didn't want to manage anymore. Like yes. I just wanted to put it out there. Let everybody who reads it, you manage how you think about it. I'm yeah. just putting it out there. Yeah, uh, for sure. That's what you did. But one of the things about the way you did it, which I find so cool uh, as a writer, was there's this, a lot of this book is about inner process. A lot of the book is really about being lost. And a lot of it is about messiness. But the way you write it, you use a lot of... Um, it's, you know, copywriting, brand writing is a little different in that it's about implying and leading and letting people into this journey. And I feel so much of the book's strength is that you frame these moments that are really, you know, could have been a deep dive into a really kind of swampy place. You get that feeling across without getting stuck in it. And this book really moves. So even though there's a lot of scenes of being lost or wandering or wrong turns, I think that even happens literally in your book where you just, you're out driving and you, you don't even know where you are. There's something about the way you write it that makes it such a narrative journey. And I'm wondering, how did that narrative emerge? Was it, was it the kind of book where you're writing it and it kind of tells you how it's going or did you structure it like, I'm gonna write it like this and this and this? No, I thought, I thought a lot about structure and I thought a lot about how do I tell this kind of condensed uh, story in this condensed period, but bring in other parts of my life and other things that had happened that still were in my, you know, in my head and were still influencing how I saw things and, and felt about things. 
and they were still causing me to behave in in certain ways. I do think the copywriter in me is what helps this book kind of move along really quickly. I am sort of, um, you know, cheap with my words. I don't go into a <laughs> lot, of, you know, a lot of flourishes. I'm a very good copywriter in in, in terms of you know that type of style that I that I endeavor, but um. A lot of what a lot of the dialogue in the book and a lot of what the book is made up of is an internal dialogue and a lot of it was the conversations I was having with myself and the things that I was thinking and feeling. And so I just tried to put them down in a you know very straightforward way, the way you're actually thinking about something like, you know, you know, if you're really unhappy with something you do, you literally say, like, oh, I just totally screwed that up. You don't really need to say much more than that. Like that's how you feel. And that kind of puts it out there. So someone said to me when they were reading this book that they were sort of screaming out loud as they were reading it as I was going from like one disastrous event to the other. No, Sarah, no, don't do that. Don't do that. Don't do that. And then he said to me, and then you did it. <laughs> like, so the one thing about the book that I'll say for everybody is I do lead you right to the edge of a cliff, you know, with self-pity, with bad choices, with unreliable behavior. But I do promise you a happy ending, but you got to kind of get to the last page to see that. <laughs> yes. Uh, what I also appreciate about the journey is that you're, there's no, there's really no finger pointing as I read it. There's such, there's a lot of responsibility of just like, yeah, this is what I'm doing and I'm in it. Not like this is making me do this or, oh, this person made me do this. There's a lot of, uh, you really owned that journey. And I think you told me earlier that that was a message you would love to have people walk away from this book. Uh, they're, you know, the lobster story is about taking responsibility for your own journey. And how would you articulate that a little bit better than I am? Well, one of the things I wanted to make sure that I was doing in writing this book was I wanted to make sure that I wasn't running away from things that I needed to face again. And I wanted to look at them through perhaps a healthier perspective and maybe one that was a little bit more forgiving and one that put my actions, um, um, that well, one that was not about perpetuating shame or guilt, but more about self-empowerment for sort of facing up to things that you, know, you did when you were going through a really difficult period um, of time. So the journey for me was really, um, to me, it was like about let the healing process begin, you know, put it all out there and just tell your story because even if one person can kind of relate to it, it it's, worth, it's worth just laying it all out there about the antics and the bad behavior and the things I shouldn't have done and, um, and taking a lot of the, some of the criticism for it. And the other thing on my journey is it does sort of lead you to, I think, I mean, it's, it's such a journey of seeking um, satisfaction from the external world, you mm -hmm. know, buying and shopping and what can I do to be happy and acquire and accumulate around me where in the end, all my endeavors were doomed. They were 100% doomed. I went to psychics and I went to tarot readers and I went shopping and I saw mediums and everything I did left me feeling worse than before I did it. I felt like even the spirit world was sick of me and I couldn't, that pocketbook wasn't making me happy anymore. And, and I started to feel completely invisible, um, completely invisible. And I lost who I was because I, who I was, was identified so much with a title. I was a copywriter. I was a business person. I was a CEO. I was a mom. I was a mom on an everyday basis. I'm still a mom, but I wasn't mothering on an everyday basis. Mm. And so I lost the anchors that helped me identify who I was. So the journey that I wanted to take was actually figure out who I was, what did I need to change? Could I change? How do I change? So I see this journey really as sort of a book of how do you change your life? Hmm. It seems also that this change wasn't something that you were like, uh, seeking out that it was almost thrown at you or you were thrown into it and did it take you by surprise when the events that happened in this book as you left and as you as they started to happen were you were you surprised by all of this would it seem like something was getting uh like where is this coming from you know um 
you have to just trust your body. You know, you have feelings. You, it's really hard to put your uh, finger on something maybe specific sometimes of like, what was the motivation? You know, um, why did I feel like I needed to make a change? Well, you know, just look, look around your life. Like you ha had 15, we're supposed to have 15 people. And this is the opening scene of the book. I was supposed to have 15 people over for brunch. Um, the house looked like a war zone had happened. The food was dripping off the walls from some kind of wild all night party. I was partying with my son and his friends, ridiculous. And I had bought these lobsters to have a really amazing New Year's Day celebration. Every, every one of them had been cooked except for this one lobster that had kind of escaped. And I think change is really hard. And the older we get, I think the harder sometimes it is to change. And sometimes what you really need is like a jolt, something mm -hmm. that all of a sudden just kind of wakes you up and says, oh my God, if this isn't a sign or a signal, you know, I don't know what it is. I have to pay attention. To me, that was the lobster crawling out from under the chair. Uh, yeah, your, your, your book is filled with signs. It's, it's filled with somebody looking for signs and symbols. Do you still feel that way or did this... After completing um, your journey, do you feel like, do you, are you still looking for signs or are you taking more internal cues? What's, what's changed there? I, I think I'll always look for signs. I think I'm a seeker who now I, I don't count on them necessarily so much. I have much more faith in myself. Um, I, at one point when I was writing this book, I was becoming more and more unsure of everything. I was becoming so unsure of every thought every impulse, every inclination, every decision. And now, and, and so I was really searching for somebody tell me, tell me what to do. Give me a sign. Oh, the leaf moved, the bed, the curtain swayed, the bed sheet rippled. Great. Okay. I'm going to do it. So I'm really um, becoming much more confident in the decisions that I'm making now that I've kind of completed this little journey and I don't use signs as symbols, but boy, I, you know, I'm a believer. I'm a believer. Right on. So one of, the, one of the things that's interesting here is that I would think that when you're running an operation, like uh, to the extent that you did, when you're running creative teams and you're running business, you had to make a lot of decisions very fast and you made more right decisions than wrong decisions because you have, you've had a tremendous career. When you were in that, in that mode of business mode, are you still like that? You don't, are you still a searcher when you're in business? How, how did this change? Because I, you know, I worked with you, I worked uh, for you. And I remember very, very dialed, very competent, very just like knowing how to move this really complex process forward. Do you think that that part of your brain was given like a vacation or that part of your brain went away when the job went away and you had to develop another part of you? Is this what the story's about also? Well, you, you know, like the, the, you know, the, the tale, like, the shoemaker's children have no shoes. I mean, it felt kind of like that for me. Like I could still do that for clients, for businesses, for brands. But when I took what I did every day and tried to apply it to myself, it, it, I was lost. I, I just couldn't do it, you know? So I don't think it turned off. I just think it never turned on for me. Interesting. That must've been, a, you know, there's a lot of fear. I mean, it's a very entertaining book and it's very, fun uh the way it reads this is a book that i think i read in two maybe three sittings it just flies but it must have been a very scary experience this is like a real journey you know the night journey journey through darkness really uh what like where were your family and your friends during all of this um so i hit a lot of stuff you know i really hit a lot of stuff of what i was doing if you'll talk to some of my friends uh, some of my friends who i've given the book and i said read it they said to me I had no idea you were feeling this way I had no idea you were going through this you always look so fun and happy and we're kind of up for anything and I think that was what I was talking about before where this is where I got really really good at advertising where I could really kind of just hide behind an image that I wanted to put out there and create for myself so a lot of my friends were really surprised when they read some of the things in the book that I'd been doing Unfortunately, my family was not surprised because <laughs> they were right there, you know, with me. And I even said to my younger daughter just the other day, um, you know, isn't it kind of crazy? It really took me to, to write a book to figure out that I 
been going through a midlife crisis. And she said, well, you were the only one that didn't know that if that's the case. So, um, you know, so, and my children are uh, super supportive of this, really aligned with me on, on telling the story and, and getting, getting it out there and supportive and loving all the way. Right on. Yes, they come across as wonderful people. You're really lucky to have them. They're lucky to have you too. Uh, you also noticed, or you mentioned some new relationships that this book is bringing into your life. Uh, someone you met on Instagram who sent you a note and said, I'm a lobster too. It's so funny. So I started getting these sort of messages on my Instagram from people saying, I'm a lobster too. I'm a lobster too. And started sort of sending me messages with this idea that, you know, they also had a hard time in their life when they suffered and they survived. So they were a lobster. So I kind of never thought about that. Obviously the lobster was a, was a different, uh, it was a, more of a character for me. It was, it was a, you know, a, the jolt that I needed, but to other people, they're kind of taking it and making it their own and calling themselves lobsters. And so, I mean, I, I think, I, I guess anybody that survived is now a lobster. I think it's so, really cool how things can kind of take on a life of their own when you put something out there and you put it out there and you kind of just put it out there like this and let people bring their own self to it and I think that's really what's most exciting for me about this yes uh, I would imagine that's super cool what is that like the title is so unique there will be lobster and just as a writer where it's an interesting it sounds almost like Shakespearean doom but also fun and are you saying that there will be lobster in everybody's life, no matter who you are, what's going on, there's going to be loss, there's going to be change, uh, what, or is it there will be lobster tonight because I finished this book, <laughs> or what, you know, what is it, what's going on with that title? Well, I wish the former of what you just said, that I had the foresight to make a title, there will be lobster, and have this whole idea that, the, that we are all lobsters, that literally wasn't in my head. The lobster, the lobster makes an appearance in this book about three or four times, I think. And it's just about, for me, the having lobsters for brunch was literally sort of where it came from. It was <laughs> celebratory and it was fun and it was, um, and it went all wrong. And then the mm -hmm. lobster comes back at the end of the book to, again, we were going to do it, have lobster again, but we were going to do it the right way this time. Uh, okay. It's, it's much more um, literal for me, um, but, and there will be lobster to me was like, there will be blood. It just kind of <laughs> came from a, you know, a, a, a title like, like that. Right. I think it's also going to be the title for your life. Like you're saying <laughs> that everyone's mailing you lobster things now, <laughs> like the lobster, oh. this lobster pot holders, lobster can, like. Yeah, yeah. I'm the <laughs> easiest person to buy a gift for right now. There'll be a lot of lobster. In, in I have lobster industry. everything. Yeah. Um, what's, uh, you know, getting to the point, this is interesting, in the passage that you just read is these, the women who said that you're going to find some meaning in your life through service. Yes. And it seems like this book, ironically enough, you were just like, yeah, whatever, I'm going to go have a tequila. It's almost like that this book really is that service in a lot of ways, that they were right. Um, what would you hope is the service that you provide? I also know through your other project of Karma mm -hmm. that you're really interested in giving back and understanding how we can provide a service in the world. What do you think is a service in this book that you would love to see uh, bloom or that you would love to see people benefit from? Well, I mean, I do think in a way, again, that the service to others is 100% the way that you should, you, you know, to approach the world in order to feel better to helping people is the best way you can feel um, better about yourself. And putting you know, service in the world is sort of something I really believe in. And I think that this book for me, in a way it, it, is a, it does a service of a self-help book, but it's not really a traditional self-help book where it's not sort of having all these kind of like how to's or tips or tricks or things like that, what to do, but it can help a reader if they can, relate at all to what I'm talking about. And I want them to hopefully find hope, realize they're not alone, that it's okay to tell all the weird, crazy things that you do, and no one is gonna think less of you. Actually, they'll think better of you for being open and honest, and they'll appreciate your honesty. 
And I learned so much through just talking to people where, you know, somebody will be like, oh yeah, no, I'm great. And I'll be like, really? Because I haven't been able to get out of bed all day. And finally they'll say, well, you know, I can't get out of bed either anymore. And then the real conversation will start and it starts through storytelling and talking about what you're actually doing and your behaviors. I think that's in a way um, a self-help book and a, and, a, and, a, and a service to others to let them relate, let them relate and feel like they're not alone. Right. And I think the value especially is also where we're such a capitalistic striving society mm -hmm. to see a high powered executive say that and kind of, and, and put that out there. It's, it's even more impressive, I think. Uh, and the interesting thing for me is, you know, just again, for me, having known, having known you in one circumstance, having known you uh, as completely dialed on Prince Street, and then reading about, uh, you know, you're wandering through the wilderness in sweatpants, like eating ice cream. Uh, it's, it's classic. It's really, it's really cool to see that. And I drew also elements to my story. I was like, oh, this is, you know, I've been through a certain lobster moment in my life where things change. To me, this book was also about like grief. I think anybody who's been through a grieving process will really relate to this. If this is you talked about a lot of the life changes that you're going through, but you might sum it up as a, a passage through grief. Um, and it's such a weird journey. These journeys that you go through and change major life changes. As you said, you don't, it's not like a tip. There's no tips. There's no hacks. You know, it's just like this weird thing that happens that you've got to move with. And that's what I also loved about the book is that you're not selling it. So like, but then I found this thing. And if you do this, this, and this, it'll make everything better. It's like, no, you just unfortunately have to, move through the terrain and move through the territory. So if I were to say marking that territory, like who you were before and who you are now after, you know, it's Sarah before and then there will be lobster and Sarah now, how would you, how are they different? How are you different now? I have relinquished control. And, you know, in right in the end of the book and spoiler alert, <laughs> I was diagnosed with chronic leukemia and in getting that diagnosis, I, I realized that it was not in my power to make it go away. It was not in my power to find a cure. It's incurable. I have it. I have to live with it. I have to take care of myself in order to stay healthy. I have to monitor my blood every six months. Um, but it's all out of my hands. And it's actually really liberating. It's really liberating to not have to try to control things. So I really think that I have really learned to kind of give myself up a little more to sort of the mysticism and the mystery of stuff that happens, take it in in the moment, and then, you know, then figure out what, what to do with it, but not always, although my, did, my daughter did call me Patty Planner the other day, so I do still kind of like planning, but I really, really have relinquished a ton of control. <laughs> I like that nickname. <laughs> your daughter, your daughter, by the way, is a superstar in this book. She's yes, uh, yes. you said she's studying writing as well. So you've got another writer in the family. She is uh, studying to get her MFA now at Sarah Lawrence College, which is what I did too. So oh, that's so cool. And any last question? I think it seems like we're getting closer towards, I'm sure a lot of people have questions. Uh, what do you think now? Is this a career? Was this a moment that you wrote a book or is this a career change for you? Are we going to see more books from you? You know, I've always been a writer, so I think I'll just keep writing. I'm not sure what I will write next, if it's another book, perhaps some articles, but um, for sure there will, there will be more from me in terms of uh, writing. Fantastic. Thank you, Hugh, for, for such great questions. Um, we covered ground that, you know, was really interesting. And I want to say only ground that you and I could cover having worked together and in the same career. Now, the other thing I wanted to tell you was so interesting. Hugh started off as a writer and a novelist and went to copywriting. And I now started, I, I started off in copywriting and now I'm switching over to kind of writing. So Hugh and I's careers have just like gone complete opposite direction. Thank yeah. you both. This has been a truly wonderful conversation and so so great to hear the two of you, you talk with each other. Um, audience, any questions that you have, please type them in the chat and I will pose them for you. 
Um, and Sarah, while we're waiting for the audience to type, I actually have a question of my own. Mm -hmm. um, it seems like the process of writing this book was really a healing experience for you, yeah. a very positive one, um, which is not always the case in terms of what I hear from writers. And do you have any advice for who are looking to writing as part of a healing journey? Um, you have to be honest with yourself. And you have to really be super clear on what story you want to tell and then tell it without holding anything back. Like my best advice would be to bring it and don't feel like, um, don't feel shame in terms of what you want to talk about, put it out there and feel empowered to do that. And so um, that's how I would think about it in terms of just, getting the story out. And then, you know, I thought a lot about structure too in writing this. How do how was I going to structure this really difficult period and take people sort of into my head and out of my head and into into the past and and do it. So um I decided to start from what I call rock bottom because I thought, you know what, I think if I wanted to be really, really forthright and really honest, I wouldn't start this book from a happy place to let everybody know I was okay and then take them down, take them down with me. I wanted to start from the bottom and show how you could rise up. Very nice. Um, one question I just got in my direct messages asks, you touched briefly on um, what your, your family's reaction was? Were there any reactions that you got that surprised you? Um, not from my family. I mean, I did get some reactions from people who have read the book, like some reviewers, and um, some people are very critical of my, my mothering, and they have called me a bad mother. Um, and perhaps I was at a certain, certain point where I was, you know, I was always really trying to walk the line between like there's always boundaries right with your with your family and sometimes I cross those boundaries where um my children are adult children and they don't need to be mothered but you know uh, my my humanness and my motherliness sometimes got a little um confused <laughs> critics are always um quick to be very hard on mothers I find yeah um, Victoria asks, Sarah, will you do a book tour? Well, it's very interesting launching a book during a pandemic because this actually is the book tour. <laughs> and, um, and hello, Victoria. Oh, now I see you. Oh, I have known Victoria for so long. I think Victoria was a client. Um, so that's right. I was a client, uh, beginning when it was Arnell Bickford. Yes. The OG. Yes. <laughs> the OG of clients. Well, welcome. It's nice to see you. Nice um, to see you too, Sarah. Yeah, launching a book during this time is really, um, it's got challenges, but you know, here we are, we're all together. There's like 20 some of us together on this little tour and, and that's how it's working. Um, so Linda asks, is there anything that you omitted from the book that you wish you had included? And conversely, do you have any regrets? No regrets. Um, maybe I could have included more. Um, one of the things people have said to me and said to me was, oh, I wished you went deeper. Now, I, I, I thought I went pretty deep, but um, maybe I could have gone a little bit deeper more into how I was feeling about myself as a woman. And I think that's something that people were wanting to hear a little more. Um, but um, I think I went as deep as I wanted to. I mean, I think I spent years with my top of my pants unbuttoned that I let everybody know how much weight I had been gaining and um, walking around and sweat. I pioneered sweatpants way before the pandemic. So, you know, I, I think from the things I wrote, um, a reader could, could get a sense of what I was looking like and how I was feeling. But I, I, I do think maybe people wanted a little bit more, but no, no regrets to me. This is the book that I wanted to write and the story that I wanted to tell. And hopefully the people that will resonate with it will find it helpful and maybe a little fun. So there's a great question from Deandra asking, 
Um, she's preparing to leave for Sarah Lawrence for her MFA um, and just bought the book for her mom. So yay, thank you, Deandra. Um, any tips on making the most of the MFA program? Well, you know, it's, I went there quite a while ago, but just participate. Like it's a lot of writing. You sometimes have to turn in, you know, 25 pages a week. And there's weeks where sometimes you feel like, oh my God, I can't do 25 pages. And you try to recycle something old and like zhuzh it up a little and then think, oh, next week I'll do it right. Just do, do the work that it takes because you will get so much great feedback from your peers. There's so many smart students in that program as well as incredible professors. You're there paying a lot of money to be there. Make the most of it. And actually that brings up another question that I had. Um, I've heard a lot of writers coming out of having worked in marketing, you know, that it's a great way to get your 10,000 hours in sitting there writing. Yeah. Um, but I have not heard, and this could just be my own ignorance, of a lot of writers, a, a lot of people graduating from MFA programs and going into advertising. Is that an unusual career path? And if so, how did, how did that happen for you? Well, I didn't get my MFA till I was 50. So I actually had my whole career in copywriting. And then I had this idea in my head that I really wanted to teach at some point. And so I went back to grad school as a writer to get my MFA and I got it in fiction um, with the idea that I was at some point going to teach. And in fact, I am teaching at Parsons, uh, but I'm not teaching writing, I'm teaching advertising. So <laughs> it doesn't always work out the way you plan. Isn't that always true? <laughs> yeah. Um, so is there any fiction in your future? You know, I love fiction. I am a reader of fiction. In fact, the one of the one of the books that inspired sort of how I was structuring the story was this inc really fun piece of fiction called The Perfect Nanny. And it's it was really inspiring because the first line of the book which was a very heavy line was the baby is dead. So you open up this book about this nanny, but the first line is that. And the first thing I thought was, oh, this book is gonna take me on a journey now to figure out how that happened. And that was one of the real inspirations. So I read a lot of fiction and it inspires me and in sort of my storytelling that's really nonfiction, but I, I love the dialogue and fiction. I love the sort of structure and fiction. So I, I, I use that to really help me create the arc of the story I wanted to tell. And then my last question of my own is a, another local tie. Is there anything from your experience at Skidmore that wound up being helpful to you in the process of writing this book? Well, yes. Well, you know, um, I do remember from my freshman year eons ago, um, studying with Bob Boyers, who runs the English department there to this day. I came to Saratoga several years ago and I studied at the New York State Writers Institute, you know, with Bob and I studied under Rick Moody and did a ton of writing in Saratoga. It's an incredibly inspirational place to be an incredible place to go to college um, and just inspiring in and of itself in terms of the liberal arts education that really kind of teaches you to how to think, how to think and how to just think your way through things. And that's been invaluable. Yeah, I think all of us here in Saratoga are really fortunate to have uh, Skidmore here for the way it has really influenced the culture locally in, in some pretty incredible ways. Um, there is a comment slash question from Jean in the chat. I'm um, saying, I'd love to hear more about your family and Socrates. It could be another great book. Can you tell us, the rest of us, a little bit of what, that's a, what that is? Yeah, so um, so I wrote about, I wrote in the book about sort of the, the way I grew up in Socrates, New York, and um, just about an hour or so, a little bit more than an hour south of Saratoga. So um, I grew up in a really large sort of extended family. So I grew up living in a house where my grandparents lived on the fourth floor. My great grandparents lived on the third floor. My great aunt and uncle lived on the next floor. And we all shared sort of a communal kitchen in the basement. And we, um, 
you know, I slept, I don't know where I slept on a couch somewhere. My sister slept in a mattress in a corner somewhere. And it was a huge, loving, extended family where I felt like I had about seven different parents, not just, you know, two or one. And, and it's a town where, um, from an ancestral perspective, my family had been there since 1640 uh, as Dutch settlers. So it's a town that's very much ingrained into my, my family. And it's one of those towns where when you grow up there, you know everybody and everybody knows you. Um, so it's been a really, it, I mean, maybe it, is, maybe it is a bit of a book going back there because there's, there's quite a story about sort of the hometown and how sometimes you, you know, they, they say you can't go home again. Sometimes you have to go home again. It's sometimes the only way, only thing you can do to ground yourself. I'm forgetting its name, but there's a great little independent bookstore in downtown Saugerties now, which Vermont. my census has been, yes. And it's, yeah. that's been there a long time. Was that there in your childhood? No, that wasn't. I think, I think it was a disco on that corner in my childhood. <laughs> and also Faith in the, uh, in the comments says that she was in the attic. That's my sister. <laughs> Well, sadly, this has been so much fun and so interesting, but we, I'm afraid, are just about out of time. Um, I've really enjoyed hearing from you, Sarah, and you, Hugh. I, I really appreciate your, your time and your energy, and Sarah, how open you've been about this book and your process. Um, audience, thank you also for being here with us tonight. You can order Sarah's book at northshire.com or pick it up in either Northshire location in Saratoga Springs, New York, or Manchester, Vermont. Thank you so much, Rachel, for organizing this. Um, if you buy a book from Northshire and you want to try to, you want me to sign it, Rachel and I will try to figure out how to make that happen. No worries. I'm always up for a good trip to Saratoga. So, um, so maybe we should count on that, Rachel. So. <laughs> <laughs> if, if you want specifically a signed book and you're ordering it, make a note of that in the notes field when you're checking out. And uh, Sarah and I will talk and try to figure out a way to make that happen for everybody. Perfect. Always, always need a good reason to come on up there. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, everybody. And have a wonderful rest of your evening. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you, Hugh. And thank good you, thing. everybody, for joining. Lovely to see you. Good night. Bye.